I don't know. Can everybody hear me? I, I've got a pretty big voice. So. Sounds good. Everybody good? Okay. Good? Okay. We do have a couple of little hard of hearing folks sometimes. but If you need it, just holler. All right. Uh, well, he's getting that fired up. Um, my name is Dennis Marshall. I'm the Social Studies Department Chair uh, at Mae Jemison High School over at Huntsville, uh, where I've been for, well, I've been there since it was Johnson, so 10 years now. Uh, I'm also a Civil War reenactor with the 19th of Alabama. Uh, the community theater with the Athenian players. I've done the, uh, I, I'm the head soccer coach over there, so I stay busy. <laughs> um, so, oh, we got, what did I say? Yeah, there it is. So I put this together a few years ago. Um, the way all this got started, I, I, as a member of the 19th, years back I got asked to do the Maple Hill Cemetery stories as the unknown Confederate soldier and because you know as the unknown Confederate soldier you don't really have a story to tell. I just took the opportunity to pick a each year pick a different aspect or thing about the Civil War and talk about that. Uh, and this past year uh, I've talked about the naval uh, action in the Civil War and how it was connected to the state of Alabama. Uh, so, uh, like I said, it grew out of that. I'd, I'd give this lecture to my honored U.S. history kids uh, about once a year. Uh, if I start going long, just stop me because uh, I, I can go for a while. So, and I'll reach back around. If you have a question, you know, like my class, raise a hand or just holler it out. I'll uh, be happy to let the field go. Uh, but we start. Keep far away from there we go. Uh, so the American Civil War ain't technology grand. Um, the, the Civil War comes about at the end of what's known as the Age of Sail, so named because the ships were powered by good old fashioned wind. Um, warships in the Age of Sail were built to engage broadside to broadside. Okay? So all the guns are along the sides. I've been fortunate enough to visit both, well, the two oldest commissioned warships in the world uh, back in 20, actually both in 2016. Uh, my wife and I went to, well, Ireland and England, and I took a day to go down to the Portsmouth Naval Dockyard uh, where HMS Victory is birthed. She's uh, uh, still the, the flagship of the British Home Fleet, technically, um, but she's in permanent dry dock. So she's the oldest commissioned warship in the world. 100 gun, first rate ship of the line, uh, really nifty. Uh, below that is the picture of USS Constitution, the oldest commissioned warship afloat, uh, because she's actually in Boston Harbor in the water. Um, so, uh, and in, unfortunately, in both cases, when I was there, they were doing maintenance on the boat, uh, and the masts weren't all the way up. So, those are just what they call the stumps. Uh, the actual masts are about two and a half times as tall as what you see in these two pictures. Uh, but they were being, in the Constitution's case, replaced. There's a whole forest in Indiana where they grow the wood for the Constitution. Um, and Victory, I think they were just repairing. Uh, but neither one were fully rigged when I was there. But uh, there's a few pictures, the same one and then a couple inside. The one thing you got to realize about these ships is, is the, the headroom is not all there. Uh, the captain of Victory was a, one inch shorter than me, and there was one place on the entire ship he could stand up. And that's because he had a skylight built into his stateroom, and he had to be directly under it to be able to stand fully erect. Uh, so it's really cramped. Um, the ship is roughly the size of a football field, length and width, uh, and there were 700 men on board. And that was enough to fire half the guns. Uh, if you ever got into a, a fight where you were fighting on both sides, you had to divvy up your gun crews and make the rate of fire drop and things of that nature. Uh, but the Brits were the, they taught the master class on how to do that. Um, I, I've got a couple of I think I'm not, how many of y'all have seen the movies Master and Commander, or the B-movie Master and Commander? Yeah, 
awesome. Uh, if you haven't, I highly recommend it. It does a really good job of portraying combat in the Age of Sail. They built a full-size replica of a British 24-gun uh, frigate. Um, really, really nicely done. Um, so I'm just going to skip those two because I don't want to take up all your time and something you can, well, you can go to YouTube and watch. <laughs> um, but that's what you wound up with. So in the Age of Sail, what your, your job as captain was to get your broadside facing the bow or the stern of your opponent. If you never did that, you could rake them, fire down the length of the ship, and that's what happens when that occurs. It, it doesn't go well for the person getting raped. Um, so that's the, the Constitution's first victory in HMS Carrier. Um, so naval uh, architects immediately, well not immediately, they always were trying to find a way to make their ships better. The Constitution did it by simply making your hull two feet thick of fly oak, um, which was a wood unavailable in Britain, made it really, really durable. Uh, and she got a nickname Old Ironside because the British cannonballs bounced off of her. So they thought she had iron sides. Well, she didn't, but uh, that got probably a, more than a few people to think of, well, what if she did? Um, and oddly enough, well, before we get to the armor, the other big pre-war innovation technology-wise is the advent of the steam engine. Uh, late 18th, early 19th century, uh, Robert Fulton, a, I believe he was Scottish born, but uh, an American immigrant. Uh, uh, and Robert Livingston made a steam engine to a boat successfully for the first time. You know, other people would try it. Theirs just happened to be the best one of those early tries. And that happened in 1807. The name of the, the vessel was the Claremont. Uh, in 1814, another Fulton design, uh, the New Orleans, made the trip from Pittsburgh, Ohio to New Orleans and back under steam power. Okay. And the, the big thing there was is actually being able to go against the current of the Mississippi River, which is not an easy thing to do. Um, now, navies uh, were not real keen on that in steam engine because they take up a bunch of space on the ship, you've got to carry coal instead of cannonballs. Um, and eh, you know, we don't like it. Navies are almost inevitably bound by tradition. Um, so they kept married to sail power basically as long as they possibly could. And when they did start putting steam engines on their ships, basically they just took an old sailing vessel, took out some of the middle, put a steam engine in, but kept all the sails and everything else, and they would spend most of their time sailing as opposed to using the engine and save the engine for if you went into combat to give you that added maneuverability um, and uh, uh, for docking when you needed precise maneuvering with the wind that always helped you. Um, and that way they didn't have to carry a whole bunch of coal. River boats were perfect to kind of perfect naval steam engines because they could stop every night and get more coal. They didn't have to carry a bunch on the ship because they were never far from land, right? You're, you're on a river. <laughs> Even the Mississippi's only a few hundred yards wide. Uh, so I believe you can see land in either direction. So uh, that's why the river boats in the interior of America were really the, the forefront of this technology for a long time. And those designers did some really remarkable things. If you look at how heavy these ships are, but how little water they draw. Uh, some of those big steamboats can pull and draw at six, eight, ten which is not much for a ship, you know, a thousand tons when you load it with cargo. Um, so, anyway, the other innovation, of course, is armor. Okay, they took that idea of old iron sides and said, okay, let's actually do it. And of all people to actually do it, well, it kind of makes sense because their navy was completely outclassed by the Brits, were the French. It's one of the few good naval ideas they ever had. Uh, in, in 1859, they, well, let me, these are actually not just for looking here, they passed around. So here is, this is USS Minnesota, uh, 1855, basically the exact same design as USS Constitution, slightly bigger, with a steam engine. So that, that just gives you an idea. 
These are not terribly fragile. The only things that are are the mats. So just don't, don't touch the mats. But otherwise, they're pretty durable. They're very well attached to the, the flags. And they've got a little information about it. So Glory is a wooden-hulled ship, which meant she was basically built out of wood. And they slap armor on the side of it. Hence the name Iron Clad. It was clad in iron. Um, not a very successful design. Um, they quickly figured out that a ship as heavy as that, sailing it just didn't work. Uh, it was awfully slow under sail. Um, and her steam engines were not very good. Uh, but it's still a broadside type vessel. All the guns are arranged on the sides of the ship. And all these uh, kits, models that are going around, they're all 1 to 600 scale, which means the actual ship is 600 times larger than the model in every dimension of the weight. Uh, so length, width, and the height of the mast. Um, so the Royal Navy, not to be one, one up by you know, anybody, uh, said, OK, if you did the ironclad, we'll raise you one when they commissioned, in the next year, HMS Warrior. Uh, Warrior is not only, is not an ironclad, it's an iron hull ship. The entire ship was made of iron. Uh, they tested her armor by taking the biggest gun in the Royal Navy's inventory and firing it at it at point blank range, and it didn't even make it dead. They said, we got a world beater. Um, now, I don't have a model of Warrior. She's a very large vessel. Um, so again, at Her Majesty's Dockyard, now His Majesty's Dockyard in Plymouth, they actually found the warrior. It was being used as a pier, as the pilings for a pier in some harbor. They found it during World War II. They raised it and have been renovating it ever since. And there she is. Um, that tells you how tough that hull is, because uh, it's basically all original. Uh, but in lieu of the model, I have a little book I paid probably 10 pounds for the gift shop. So feel free to carouse that about Warrior. She's a really a remarkable vessel. Uh, uh, and very, very powerful. Of course, then you get the U.S. Civil War. And when the U.S. Civil War breaks out, the U.S. Navy, well, let's just call it what it was, was a joke. Uh, they had a bunch of old ships that were rotting at, at their uh, anchorages. They very rarely did it. Uh, they were underpaid, undermanned, and out of date technologically. Um, so when the Civil War starts and uh, General Scott calls for the blockade of the, the South, great idea, well, we need a Navy to do it, because uh, they didn't have it. Uh, so they basically just started grabbing anything that could float had an engine uh, and turning them into warships. Uh, a good example, is a double ender gunboat. This is the USS Fort Jackson with a walking beam steam engine. That's what you see right in front of the stack. Uh, moderately armed, but they were, their one advantage was they were fast. And that's what they needed to catch one of the uh, But that didn't come about for uh, a while. Um, and of course, the US Navy, as bad as it was, was still a leg up on the Confederate Navy because, you know, it didn't even exist. They had to build it from the ground up. So they immediately said, uh, as, as if you've never seen it, and you've got to deal with the language, I will, I'll give you that disclaimer. There's a guy on YouTube called the Fat Electrician. And one of the things he said is the worst thing you can ever do is make an American improvise. Uh, so the South had to improvise. And what they found is when they when Virginia seceded, the US Navy tried to burn the North Norfolk Navy Yard. Virginia. Uh, so they set fire to one of the Minnesota's sister ships, the, the Merrimack. Um, thought they'd done a pretty good job, but you know, necessity being the mother of all invention, the Confederates found a fairly decent hull with a still working steam engine and said, we can work with that. So they stripped it down to its uh, main deck, uh, below the gun deck, and set about building it as an and when they got done, this is a, a line drawing of it, she was rechristened the CSS Virginia. Uh, and if you compare this one to the Minnesota as it floats around, 
figuratively, uh, you'll see they're basically the same length. The, the Virginia was a, probably one of the larger, if not the largest, Confederate iron. Uh, unfortunately, as you know, the engine did you know happen to have a fire around it, so it wasn't as strong as it used to be. The Virginia was very heavy. And that engine, and this is the problem that virtually every Confederate ironclad had, is their engines just weren't up to the task of moving a vessel of its size. So, just, so that's what they turned it into, uh, the Virginia. You have an armored casemate. You still have this broadside idea. Uh, the forward and aft guns were on a pivot, so they could fire both forward and to either side. Uh, then you had three guns on each broadside and another one on the stern that was a pivot. Um, Rate of fire is pretty horrendous. Crew conditions are really horrendous. Uh, temperatures in the case make could hit 120, 130 degrees. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's pretty god off. Um, but it was also the most powerful vessel in North America. So now as the Confederacy were building it, um, they thought they were doing everything nice and secret. Well, they weren't. Uh, work got to the U.S. Navy Department of what was being built, and they said, we got to come up with an answer. We're going to build ironclads of our own. Uh, the first ones occur not in response to the Virginia, but in response to we got to see the Mississippi River. And at the Illinois uh, steamboat town of Cairo, Illinois, um, a, a fellow by the name of James Eads and Samuel Poop set about building ironclad river gunboats. Well, initially for the U.S. Army of all people, but eventually the Navy, you know, they said, hey, it's a boat, we won't want in on that. Um, so the first design was one of Eads on ships, uh, snag boat number seven, which he converted into the USS Essex, which for a long time was the most powerful vessel on the Pacific. Um, it's a catamaran hull, so it actually had two separate holes and then it bridged over the top. Uh, and you'll notice that the paddle wheel, these were, all of these designs were paddle wheel steamers. Instead of being on the, the stern of the vessel or on the side, they, on the ironclad gunboats, they moved the paddle wheel into the middle of the boat. Uh, which was, again, you know, you got to come up with something because it makes it a lot easier to protect. Uh, the purpose built ones were uh, eventually called the city class ironclads. They were all named after. Uh, big river boat towns on the Ohio Mississippi River. So you had the Cairo, the Pittsburgh, uh, um, St. Louis, et cetera, the Carondelet. Uh, but they're collectively known as the city class, or as they got nicknamed, Poots Turtles. Uh, because they said, well, it looks like a turtle. Uh, and these were the ships that uh, steamed down the Cumberland River, uh, or well, the Tennessee River, and basically seized uh, Fort Henry before Grant even got there. Uh, they didn't fare as well against uh, uh, Fort Donaldson because it was up on a bluff, and they're not armored on top, so they were able to shoot down and just kind of bypass all that armor. The gunners at uh, Donaldson actually disabled three city class MDSs and wounded uh, Admiral Foote, who was the, the, the commander of the flotilla. Um, in addition to the Merrimack, uh, the owner of a tugboat in New Orleans decided to convert his tugboat at his own expense into an ironclad. He was going to use it as a privateer. I don't know what gave him that idea. It was slow to catch anything. Uh, but it was really small. It presented a very small target. And the one thing it had going for it, if you know anything about tugboats, their engines are typically a lot bigger than what they need to be in the tugboat. Because they got to push something else. So it was the one Confederate ironclad that actually had really good engines. And it had two in a very small package. It was relatively fast. They're, and most of the Confederate ironclads were built as rams. Their main attack is not the guns, it was to run into the other guy. Uh, so this boat is rechristened the CSS Manassas. It's a really odd looking little thing. It only has one gun in the bow. Uh, but she was a ram. And that's how she was going to be used. Uh, however, her career was very short-lived, as were most Confederate ironclads, uh, as she was sunk at the Battle of New Orleans uh, by her crew um, and was lost along with the 
entirety of what was known then as Louisiana State Navy um, at the Battle of New Orleans. Uh, what's left of her, yeah. I mean, they did a pretty efficient job, so. What was the question? Uh, he said, is it still there, and uh, what's left of it? I think it is. I think there's a marker for the river. I mean, the Mississippi changes a lot, especially around New Orleans. Uh, so I think the, the site is now underwater. I don't, don't quote me on that. Uh, but there wasn't much left of it, because uh, they, they set off a magazine. Uh, now, the U.S. Navy wants, you know, again, they knew what was going on on the rivers, but they said, we need something that can go in the ocean. So they sent out work, we need designs of, you know, ocean-going or, well, sort of ocean-going ironclads. And they got three. Uh, the first is the Galena, uh, which was basically one of those little double-ender gunboats with a very neat set of armor put on it that they found out was more trouble than it was worth. They eventually strip off the armor, and it serves uh, as a wooden vessel for the remainder of the war. She actually participated in the Battle of Mobile Bay as a wooden vessel. The second and far more successful design, and probably the one the Union should have stuck with, they took a play on the, the nickname of Constitution, the old Ironsides, and this one was the new Ironsides. Um, she is a steam, classed as a steam frigate, had a full set of sails when she was commissioned, but like the glory, they realized this thing can't move under sail or squat. So they left the stub mast just to use as signal posts, uh, and she were operated always on under steam. Um, but it was an incredibly successful design. She was engaged in virtually every major fight up and down the east coast of the Confederacy. Uh, she was hit well over 300 times, and her armor was never uh, not one crewman was ever lost in action in terms of enemy fire. A couple of them got a you know, gun landing on them because they didn't get out of the way. But uh, it's really a remarkably successful vessel. But that's the new iron size. The third is the far and away the most radical design of the three. Uh, and what saved it, because the Navy Department didn't like it, because it was, I mean, it, the Navy's traditional. This went against everything, because it had no sails. It wasn't arranged as a broadside ironclad, you know, broadside vessel. It broke virtually every rule. The designer of this vessel, is, or the vessel is of course the Monitor, the USS Monitor. John Erickson, a Swedish born engineer who uh, immigrated to the United States, uh, designed it and he just went all out. The hull is very low in the water. He actually designed it so that waves would wash over the deck to stabilize it as a gun flap. Um, it had a very heavily armored pilot house toward the bow of the vessel. Um, and then it's armor. Two guns in a turret. And that was the real shakeup in naval design. Uh, the monitor and what saved it from virtual obscurity is the fact that it was the only one of the three that was ready when the CSS Virginia sailed out of uh, So it was on its way to Hampton Roads. So that gets us to the Battle of Hampton Roads, day one, March 8, 1862. The Virginia stings out of Norfolk, goes up to the Union Anchorage, uh, promptly rams and sinks the USS Cumberland, uh, which was a sailing frigate. Uh, then used gunfire to set her sister ship, the Congress, ablaze, and then ran uh, the Minnesota, the, one, the first one that went around, ran it aground. Uh, and they said, okay, that's a good day's work. They went back to Norfolk. Uh, at 9 o'clock that night, the USS Monitor was towed in the Hampton Roads. Because the one big drawback of, of Erickson's design is it was not an open water vessel. You get it out in, in the open ocean. All that waves going over the hull doesn't work real well. Uh, so she, the monitors were typically towed from point to point by other vessels for safety. Uh, but the Virginia returns on the 9th to finish off the Minnesota and finds this odd looking little thing in its way. And they set about fighting each other. Now, the monitor hit the Virginia multiple times, never pierced her arm, mainly because. 
her guns were untested and she was firing with only half charges. Had they been full charges, most naval designers believe that Virginia would not have lasted very long uh, if they just used full charges in the guns. Uh, but uh, she didn't, so they didn't. Virginia was so big and slow and ponderous, and the monitor presented such a small target, she had trouble hitting her. Now, she did a few times, but again, never really hurt the monitor in any real way. Um, so the, Virginia withdraws back to Norfolk, then McClellan lands on the peninsula, starts to it up, and they said, well, crap, we got to leave. And the Merrimack drew so much water, she couldn't make it up the James River, so her crew burned her to the scuttle. Uh, and that was the end of the Virginia. There's a very famous painting of the duel between Monitor and Merrimack, or Virginia. Uh, so the success of the Monitor creates in northern naval design what became known as the Monitor Fleet. If you were going to build an ironclad in the United States, it had to be a Monitor. You needed to turn up a very radical jump, considering, you know, one of them had seen action and, you know, fought to a draw. Uh, but that's the way it worked. So when monitors, and it's one of two ships that gave a whole group of vessels named after, the other is Dreadnought, uh, the original modern battleship. But monitors as a group, when they confronted the Confederate ironclads, performed very, very, very well. Uh, they were very well suited to engaging uh, the Confederate ironclads because they were typically had better engines, they were more maneuverable, and as a rule, presented a very small part. Uh, however, when they were fighting fixed fortifications, they did not do so well, because fixed fortifications, it's easier to aim, uh, and they got hit a lot. So it required some significant redesigns, uh, and eventually, by the last class, the Canonicus class, they had fixed most of the problems going up against fortifications as well. You also have monitors on the, the Mississippi River with the twin turret Milwaukee class of Eads design, which Erickson didn't like very much, because uh, in most respects it was superior to his designs. Uh, and uh, the single turret of Neosho and Osage classes. So what I've got next is just a collection. This just goes from the USS monitor all the way down to the Milwaukee class. So you get right here in the middle, the Canonicus class, and then the Onondaga uh, are both, both incredibly well-designed vessels. Uh, one of the odd things about the U.S. Navy at this point, all of these vessels were named after Native American tribes or individuals in the case of the Trumps. Uh, I never have really figured out why, but, you know, the U.S. Navy picks something, they stick with it. So uh, that's why you have a whole bunch of these that are really hard to pronounce. Uh, they even went so far as to take another one of the uh, Minnesota sister ships, the Roanoke, and convert it to a monitor. Uh, now, the Roanoke has the distinction of being the only triple turreted monitor. Uh, it was an abject failure because the wooden hull couldn't support all of the weight of the armor plus three turrets. But it is the uh, beginning, the grandfather, if you will, of the modern battleship because once you get to the, the 19th, late 30s, early 40s, the standard battleship turret layout is three turrets all on the center line. And so that was started by the road, even though in all other respects it was junk. <laughs> now, as the war moves on, the Confederacy gets continually produces what amount to refined versions of the, of the Virginia. They're all case-made ironclads, uh, typically. Um, and almost always woefully underpowered. Most of the Confederate ironclads were powered by the engines out of blockade runners, which were very fast. They were strong engines, but the blockade runners were very, very light. These ironclads were not. Uh, designs varied slightly from port to port. Some had very steep sides, some slanted dramatically. Uh, you had different modes of, uh, of propulsion. Uh, one, uh, um, it looks really big and bad, but it's really a, a, a piece of garbage. It's the CSS Nashville. Um, it was one of the defenders in Mobile Bay, and it couldn't even be high coming in as it was trying to go out. 
uh, it was so underpowered. Also, its paddle wheels, which were mounted on the side, were unarmed. So that was going to work out real well if she'd ever went into action. Um, one of the more amazing ones is the Albermale, a mall uh, in North Carolina. Um, she was built in quarantine. So that tells you the, the, the facilities they had available to them. Uh, but they built one of the better ironclads in that corn field. Um, but like all the others, she didn't last very long. That one was sunk with uh, a bunch of guys in the launch with an uh, explosive on the end of a stick. Uh, they stuck up with her. And that was the end of her. Now they had one ironclad built overseas. Uh, it was built in France. Uh, Eventually commissioned as the CSS Stonewall. Her history is pretty funny. Uh, so it's built in France. The U.S. throws a bid. And France said, "Okay, okay, we won't sell it to you." So they sell it to Denmark. Well, Denmark got it. We don't want this. We don't need it. So they sold it to a Belgian who sold it back to France. Who eventually sold it to the Confederacy again. Um, and they actually had, to, but they sold it after it was out of the French port in the Canary Islands, and that's where it shifted from. French to uh, Confederate uh, flag. Uh, never saw combat because when they, they got across the Atlantic, it was far and away the best ironclad the Confederacy ever had at its disposal. Um, but, you know, by the time they got across the Atlantic and, and went into Havana Harbor in Cuba, they were like, oh, war's over. Um, so, too little, too late. She's turned over to the U.S. authorities who hang on to it for a little while. We eventually sell it to Japan, of all people. And it's under the Japanese flag that it sees action in the last little quasi-civil war in Japan in the 1880s. Uh, so a really bizarre history. Um, unlike all other Confederate ironclads, she also had a sailing rig. It was brig rig with two masts. Uh, this is the one mistake the guy that made that I, well, it's a company that I bought most of these kits from. This is the one mistake he made. It was not a turn on the back, it was simply a round case made. But he could have turned on the front if want to make any cast. Uh, but, you know, that's the way that goes. Now, you know, again, necessity is the mother of all uh, invention. The last innovation, of course, is the submersible vessel. Now, they toyed around with semi submersible vessels that would get really, really low in the water. Um, but, uh, eventually, they said, well, let's just get one that goes completely underwater. Now, of course, steam engines don't work real well underwater, so the vessel they come up with, and it's built down in Mobile, paid for by a fella in Mobile, and that's who it's named after, is, the, of course, the HL Hunley. Uh, the Hunley, uh, they thought originally it was made out of a, a discarded boiler. Uh, turns out they were wrong. It was custom made. Uh, had a crew of a 11, if I'm not mistaken, uh, commander, and then a bunch of guys running a hand crank to make it go. <laughs> um, it has the notable distinction of sinking every time it runs short. Uh, so it was not a very safe uh, uh, assignment by any stretch of the imagination. Of course, if you weren't assigned, you'd volunteer. Um, they did manage to save some of the crew on one of those. Uh, so, yeah, you know. Uh, but the Hunley, this is the one that's not 1 600 scale. This one, I don't even know what the scale is. It's probably somewhere around 177. It is not a very large vessel, for so uh, But its other distinction, of course, is it's the first submarine to sink an enemy vessel. Um, they transported it by rail to Mobile, Charleston, uh, and they went out and on the night of February 17th of 64. Uh, she sinks the USS Houston tank uh, in Charleston Harbor. Now, she's never heard from again. People assumed for a long time that she was also sunk by the same explosion that sunk the Houston tank. Well, they looked for it and looked for it and looked for it and looked for it, and then they wind up back at 02, 03, I think. They found it about 150 yards from its peak. They made it almost all the way back. So the next theory was they got close air was getting kind of funky, so they got on the surface and opened the hatch, a wave came in and swamped them. Because uh, they were all those folks when she ran down. But, that's why it took us a long time. Nobody had guessed that she would have made it back. Uh, but that's the hunt. Uh, let's see. As far as other designs, uh, I, I 
couple of others just to show. Uh, on the river, of course, you had uh, non-ironclad gunboats. These are the two most famous that typically worked as a pair, the Tyler and the Lexington. Uh, they were both present at Shiloh and a few other battles. So they're both, uh, as they termed them, wooden clad, uh, as they not gave them any real protection. Um, and lastly, toward the end of the war, uh, they created two classes of ocean going bombers. These were true open water warships. Uh, one's dual turret turreted. Uh, designed to be in Tonema. Uh, the other is the Dictator. Uh, and the Dictator is a single turret, it's really, really long, heavily armored, heavily armed. Uh, the Dictator has two 50 inch dolphins. Uh, the me in Tonema has four 13 inch, which are really big guns uh, for this era. The me in Tonema actually sailed all the way. Uh, to the tip of South America, around the, the uh, Tierra del Fuego, the Straits of Magellan, and back up to San Francisco, under its own power. Uh, so, pretty remarkable design. Uh, so, Alabama's part in all of this, uh, and it, I'm, I love these posters, it was nice that they were here, is the ironworks in Alabama provided most of the materials for virtually all of the Confederate ironclads, save those that were built in and around Rich. Uh, those were provided for by the Treadgear ironworks up in the Rich area. Most of the other armor came from either local sources, i.e. railroad tracks they pulled up in the case of the Arkansas, uh, or from the ironworks in Alabama, uh, particularly the Briarfield and the Shelby. Uh, additionally, virtually the one thing the Confederate Navy never lacked was artillery. They had the most advanced guns then being designed, and all of them were cast down in Selma. That was the naval foundry for the Confederate States Navy. Uh, so even those that were built up in Virginia got guns from Selma. Uh, pardon? Selma. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the loss of Selma, you know, in 1865 really didn't matter. Uh, but they were turning out guns right up to the very end. And they were, they, the, the Confederacy never had a problem with their guns. Breaches exploding, et cetera, um, unless they overcharged. Uh, and they also provided, uh, the Selma Arsenal also provided a lot of guns for the, the, some of the fortifications around uh, the South as well. Your major Civil War naval battles, the first, of course, is the Battle of New Orleans in April of uh, 62. Now there you see uh, the CSS Louisiana getting pummeled. The artist there took a little liberty uh, because her engines weren't installed yet. She was basically just sitting there. Uh, but she did have her armor, so she was a floating battery at that battle. You see uh, the Governor Moore there uh, having a bad day. Um, the Governor Moore and actually have a bit of few. So the LS and S, Louisiana State Navy ship, uh, Governor Moore was a ram. Uh, and its, it's sole purpose of being it's unarmored was to run into somebody. And she actually did. She survived long enough to ram the USS Maruna uh, at the Battle of New Orleans. They got kind of locked together, so the captain of the Governor Moore, there was a gun on her bow pointed it down and fired at the enemy vessel through his own hull. Uh, sank the, the marina, but then the entire Union fleet sailed by and exacted divisions uh, in spades and turned it into a wreck. Uh, so the second, also on the Mississippi River, the Battle of Memphis. Uh, it's the, the location of the battle is just upriver from the city. Uh, and again, uh, you had ramming, but this time it was the U.S. Navy doing it. Uh, along the same time that Duke and Eads were building uh, the, the city class, they also built uh, a few rams, again, initially for the U.S. Army, uh, and oddly they never got the USS in front of them because they were built for the Army. So this is the, the United States ram, Monarch, 
brand of CSS General Beauregard uh, at Memphis. And she was successful and lived to tell the tale, too, uh, because it had eight city class ironclads coming up behind it. Uh, the entire Confederate flotilla was eliminated in that one battle, and that's what opened the Mississippi River with the exception of the, the area right around Vicksburg uh, to the end. Uh, the first big one uh, on the coast is, uh, was the Battle of Port Royal, uh, but it didn't involve ironclads. That was very early, late 1861. Uh, Port Royal is on Paris Island, so anybody that uh, you know, went to Marine Corps boot camp, you were somewhere near. Uh, Port Royal Sound is between Paris Island and Guilford Island. Um, but the first one involving ironclads on a large scale was the first Battle of Charleston. Um, there, the Pasadena class ironclads, the new ironsides in the Molina, and another latecomer, the Keoka, uh, uh, tried to attack Fort Sumter. And this is where all the, the downside of the monitors going up against fixed fortifications glaringly apparent because most of the turrets on the Passaic class got jammed by repeated hits. So the turret wouldn't turn anymore. And if you're a monitor, that's bad. Uh, so now the new iron side is back there. Okay, shoot us great. Knock yourselves out. Uh, and you know, kept up the fire on the Sumter, but all the others had a pretty rough day out. Um, of course, the largest engagement in Alabama during the American Civil War was the Battle of Mobile Bay. Uh, I've never been down there. Uh, of course, Morgan and Gaines are still there. Uh, pretty nifty. Uh, you know, they look nothing like they looked in the Civil War because they got cut down at the turn of the century and turned into. But, you know, still happy. but this uh, painting is when Farragut's fleet was charging. They entered the Confederate minefield, what we call a minefield today. In the Civil War, mines were called torpedoes. Torpedoes were called something. Well, they didn't have actual steam torpedoes. Um, but uh, they steamed through it, and one of the casualties was the brand new Canonics class monitor USS Tunks. Hit a mine, sank, caused lots of confusion in Farragut's fleet, and that's when he voiced his now very famous command, damn the torpedoes full steam ahead. Uh, and he rushed past them. The Confederate Defense Fleet was there right in the lee of the fort. Um, but he had promised his men they'd have breakfast in Mobile Bay and he made good on it. And then the Tennessee, uh, Admiral Buchanan, for lack of anything better to do, apparently, charged the Tennessee. Uh, the Tennessee uh, did okay, uh, considering it was one against about 17. Uh, but since three of those were ironclads, the USS Manhattan and the other Canonics class, and then oddly, and this tells you how good each design was, even though they were not designed for open water, the Milwaukee and the uh, uh, Chickasaw uh, river bombers were in Mobile Bay too, the twin turret ones, and they were really able to work the Tennessee Open. And her design flaws became apparent uh, because her steering chains were run in open channels across the deck and the stern of the vessel, so they got shot away so she couldn't turn. Her smokestack gets shot off, so now she can't generate enough pressure to actually run the steam engine. All but one of her gun ports gets dead and shut, uh, and they're trying to pry one open when a cannonball hits the very spot they were trying to pry on. The dude with the pry bar, the impact, the vibration of the impact causes that to essentially explode all over the admiral, and that's when they said, yeah, we're done. Uh, and she surrendered to the U.S. fleet. But uh, this one, I, I do apologize. Uh, I just have not taken, I would love to say, I didn't have the, the time to do it. I just didn't take the opportunity to finish it. I've still got some pain to do. But this is just a representation of the charge of the Tennessee at Mobile Bay. You have Farragut's flagship, the Hartford, uh, USS Oneida, and then the two Milwaukee class, uh, uh, or actually, yes, the Winnebago class. Uh, the Winnebago and the uh, And then there were, I think, 13 other Union vessels in the general vicinity. Uh, now, only 13 men on the Tennessee were, were casualties. Uh, and I think only the one men. But, um, 
There you go. The last big engagement was the bombardment of Fort Fisher. And here with the new canonicus class in the Hanandaga, the Navy finally figured out how to use monitors against fortification. The Fort Fisher is kind of a long, drawn out earthworks fort, but they knew where the guns were. So they assigned each monitor one gun. Your job is to take out that gun. Go do, go do it. And so by digging it up that way, you don't overlap your fire. You get close, you just sit there, and you can take whatever punishment it puts to you, and you put that one gun out of commission. Simple. And then the wooden ships just line up, you know, in extreme range and just bombard the stew out of it and keep everybody else's heads down. And it worked to perfection. Uh, allowing the U.S. Navy to land an assault force and eventually Fort Fisher Falls. Uh, and that's the last port open to Confederate blockade runners except for Corpus Christi, Texas. And since they'd already lost the Mississippi, that doesn't do them a whole heck of a lot of good. You know, when you get into Texas, great. How do you get into Richmond? Uh, so that was the big failure of the Confederate strategy in my opinion in the Civil War is not protecting the Mississippi better than they did. Um, you had abject failures of Donaldson and Henry uh, due to, well, poor location of the fort in the case of Henry, poor leadership in the case of Donaldson, um, the loss of Island Number 10 on the Mississippi, then the loss of Memphis, the loss of New Orleans, um, and really it was downhill from there because once he, you know, as Lincoln himself said, a house divided can't stand. They forcibly divided the Confederacy. Uh, they took two or three most populous cities of the Confederacy out by 1860, early 62 in Nashville and New Orleans. And it gets real tough. It's tough sled if you're the Confederacy. But uh, so yeah, I've got to yeah. I've got a couple others up here, so if you have time, you want to come up and look at them. Uh, I think they've been in others. I've got one little tray I completely forgot about that has a couple of just river boats, uh, cargo, one cargo vessel, one uh, just your typical Mississippi River steamer, uh, and then uh, the worst monitor ever built, the Casco class. Uh, it was so messed up that by the time the Navy took it, they said, okay, take the turret off. Put a spar torpedo on the front of it and call it a day. Because they were just completely worthless. Uh, but those are up there. Anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, most of the iron, it, it wasn't so much plates, it's usually strips. Uh, it's usually laminated, uh, especially on the Confederates. Now, the Union had big foundries in New York and the various navy yards that could actually turn out rolled plate two, three, four inches thick. But that's why their armor was, that's why they stood up so well against the Confederate Iron Class. The monitor soft iron, the Confederate Iron Class. Their armor was heavy. It was heavier, it was much more solid. Uh, and then, of course, they always carried bigger guns. So, you know, they only had two of them. It's kind of like, would you rather have eight M16s or two bombers? Yeah. Uh, well, right. yeah, it's not, definitely not steel. Yet. You get, steel comes about in the 1870s. Uh, the Royal Navy is the first to really start using steel on large scale. Then you get Krupp party steel and uh, you know so forth. By the time the Germans get into the act, and then you have the, all the great stuff they have. Out Oddly enough, uh, and just again, you thought the U.S. Navy would have learned its lesson going into the Civil War, the state of the Navy. Well, after the Civil War, they had the most technologically advanced Navy on the planet. And they just said, yeah, Congress said, yeah, great, we're not paying for it anymore. Uh, so by the, what really spurred the U.S. Navy back into action is when they were, New York Harbor was visited by a Peruvian ironclad. And the admirals in the U.S. Navy were there and said, we don't have anything. And that's Peru. <laughs> they said, heaven forbid we got to tangle with the Brits at this point. So that kind of got them spurred on. And it's, it's almost comical what they have to do with these ships. They built four monitors with the exact same names of old Civil War monitors that were still on the books in the 1880s. Uh, and they told Congress the funds were to uh, 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 fix those old monitors. Where, in fact, it 
with brand new ships that just happen to have the same name. That's, how, that's what they were reducing to trying to get new ships until that happened. And then, you know, the building started, and you get a fellow by the name of Teddy Roosevelt in charge of the Navy Department, he's not going to be second to anybody if he has anything to say about it. He gets birth the modern day. So. But yeah, the Navy, you know, it's tradition. They had to learn the same lesson twice before they got it under control. Yes, sir? Okay, during that, in that time period, a big problem with the early steam engines were boiler explosions. Correct. Uh, one clause was when the operator would tie down the safety valve to get higher pressure steam, and also metallurgy wasn't so well known, and uh, with some corrosion, cracks would develop in the boilers. How much do these boiler explosions come into play during the, the war war? I, I can't think of one off the top of my head that was catastrophic. They had several. Uh, the only one I know of that was catastrophic were, was the, it wasn't even in action, it was a steamboat that was carrying okay. prisoners, yeah, the Sultana from Fort Pillow, you know, the boiler went to the boom um, They did have some issues uh, at Fort Donaldson, not because the boilers themselves were faulty, but, you know, a Confederate cannonball made them faulty. Uh, that's what got the essence, is they took the shot right through the boiler through its unarmored group. Uh, so that's the only Navy problem. And had, you know, the one thing that saved those ships that were disabled by Donaldson was the fact that the Cumberland River was flowing north at that point. So when they lost power, they pushed away from the port instead of the port. Uh, otherwise, they would have all been, probably had to have been either scuttled or would have been damaged. But I can't think of uh, uh, a big instance where a boiler explosion did in a ship beyond the salt. It's quite common in railroads yes. and industrial applications. I think it was just the mere fact, I think naval engine designers, while, yeah, metallurgy wasn't as advanced as they, I think they took a lot more time to stuff on a ship because you might be out in the middle of the ocean, so they were a little more careful. That's why I think you saw it more in steamboats and, like you said, railroad engines, wherever it goes, you know, you walk to the next station and, you know, call for a new engine. Uh, and, you know, sorry about the guys in the engine that, you know, aren't with us. Uh, but, yeah, I think, think that's, I, and I'm by no means saying it didn't happen. But I just think, especially with the ironclads, I don't think it ever did. Yes, ma'am. With regard to the wheel housing and the armor, how mm -hmm. far below the waterline did the armor go? I'm assuming not very far because of drag, and later did they make adaptations to that? Yeah, the, the armor belt on the monitor, and that's another reason for Ericsson's design, so low in the water, they didn't have to extend the armor very deep because uh, the freeboard on the monitor was only like 18 inches. <coughs> so, at full load, the depth was a foot and a half above the water. Uh, so uh, it was really a, in a, in a, like everything about the monitor was radical and innovative. Uh, but that's typically the way it went. Uh, as you move into the latter part of the 19th century, of course, they do get deeper and deeper into the hull, then you have to start adding the torpedo bulges and everything else uh, by the time you get to World War I, and especially in World War II. Uh, you have armor belts extending below the water line significantly. But these, not so much. Now, the pilot houses, you saw on the monitor, it's on the front. The Union actually figured out that was uh, another thing they figured out. If you look at the, the other models, you see the pilot houses are now on top of the turret. So that way, in action, they could communicate instead of having to send some schmuck running from turret to pilot house and back the whole time. Uh, but the pilot houses typically had, I want to say, between 8 and 12 inches of armor. Uh, because they were fairly small, so the one on the monitor, you know, it was a bit of solid iron. Uh, I think it would be a cast, if I'm not mistaken. The pilot house. The original monitor was solid. Not in action. Uh, yeah, after uh, uh, Battle of Hampton Roads, they were towing it uh, along the east coast down toward Charleston. Uh, and it was swamped in a storm off Cape Hatteras. Uh, they located it not too many, they've actually raised the turret. Uh, oh, okay. 
Uh, I think that the short answer to that is most of those boilers used a closed system uh, wherein the, the water it was just continually used and then condensed and reused, you know, boiled, condensed, boiled, condensed, boiled, condensed. And the, the engineers running it just knew their business and knew how not to run it dry. Because uh, I think it was a big issue to try and rewater the boilers on those steam, steam boats. Because typically the engines are at the very bottom of the ship for weight distribution. You don't want a ship to be very top heavy or it'll roll over real easy. So they're kind of a pain to get to. Uh, and I think that was just, you know, just one of those things. They figured it out by trial and er error, obviously. But once they had it figured out, they kind of just stuck with it. And there wasn't a lot of technology. Oh, there was and there wasn't. I mean, compared to what we have today, no. But for the time period, these were radical technological innovations. So, I mean, they were pushing the edge of what was technologically possible in the mid-19th century. Yes, that's all. You know, even though they were using wrought iron, wrought iron can occur in several allotropes, like austensite, martensite, ferrite, and for example, martensite is very, very hard, very, very brittle. Uh, one of them is a body center cubic structure, another one is a face center cubic structure. Was any of that understood at the time, and were they able to tell the properties of the uh, armor to the and again, this is just a guess because I'm by no means a metallurgist. Uh, my guess is they knew there was a difference. Uh, they knew that iron coming from this foundry had the certain properties that was different than others. Uh, but I, I would wager they didn't know why that was the case. But uh, they would, just through trial and error, use the right kind, I guess is the best way to put it. Uh, because if you, you know if it's brittle, it's not going to work as iron because it'll crack. Uh, so they would have avoided that type of iron, you know, because they would know what it was. And Martin's site over time will rearrange, I mean, I believe it becomes a ferrite, which is less brittle, but also less hard. Right. Again, you apparently know more <laughs> about that than I do. Uh, that explains why. Um, but anyway, uh, thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, one other thing I will mention, uh, because not a lot of people know about it, uh, it used to be the Confederate Naval Museum, now it's the Museum, uh, Civil War Naval Museum, is located down in Columbus, Georgia. Uh, I visited it several times when I was in Auburn, uh, but they've got a new building and everything. I visited it the last time I was through Columbus, which has been a minute. Uh, but it's really, really a good museum if you're at all interested in any of this. They have some really nice uh, stuff there. They have the remains of a Confederate ironclad to Jackson that was being built in Columbus that was, you know, they burned before they even got it finished. Uh, and another small ship, and uh, they've got a mock-up of another one now. Uh, so, it, yeah. But it's really a nice museum. So. Just want to give them a, a little plug. The members in the, the Georgia Division had a half scale plunder.
so much for having me. Do you know where the sign, um, sign sheet is? Well, uh, it was on the table over there. Off? No. You're part these, of his oh, thing. Oh, these are somebody's collection. Mm hmm These are not door prices? <laughs> you can ask, but I doubt it. 